Hello, my name is Simon Fischer. I'm a PhD student from Kiel University, and I'm going to talk about stopping problems with finite time horizon. Um, I want to analyze these problems via a integral equation and show how we can use this integral representation uh, to look at the limit behavior of the optimal stopping set close to that time horizon. The talk is based on a project that I've done together with Sören Christensen, also from Kiel University. So our setting is that our driving process is a standard Brownian motion in n dimension that we denote by W. Um, the whole process works in the same way for a Brownian motion with drift, but for simplicity we take a standard Brownian motion. Um, and we start it at some time t, and t is lower or equal to zero, and zero will be our finite time horizon, so we'll stop the pro process at zero. Then we have a payoff function, usually we denote it by g in general, um, but we want to look at a special case of discounted problems where we have a payoff function of that form where we have some function h that is usually c2 um, that only depends on x and some discount rate r greater or equal to zero. Then uh, we want to optimize over stopping times that lie between this negative t and zero and um, so in the general Markovian form our stopping problems reads that the value function v is the supremum over the expectation of our gain function g where we plug in the standard Brownian motion. So the setting looks more like less like that and since we're in a Markovian setting we can describe the problem uh, by dividing the space into a continuation set that we denote by c and a stopping set that we denote by s and an optimal stopping time will be the first entry into the stopping set s or of course uh, stopping at the finite time horizon zero. We will need some more notation later on. Um, so additionally to our um, continuation set and our stopping set we will use these slices for a fixed time t um, through the sets and we denote it by a subscript with t. So ct is the continuation set at time t and um, st is the stopping set at time t and of special interest later on will be this set c0, so the continuation set at the end of time 0. Um, also important what we will uh, need later on is the generator of the process and in our case the generator is just one half the Laplace operator plus the partial derivative after t and in the special case of a discounted problem it takes the rather easy form where we have just the discount factor and then um, a multiple of the function itself minus the Laplace operator and this latter part we just denote by h tilde and later on we will only write h tilde and not write it all out. Then continuation set and stopping set are just defined as usually. Important to notice here maybe is that we can find c0 easily and c0 we know that from general theory is just the space where this h tilde, that one over here, um, is negative. Uh, so we can divide the whole space and the part where h tilde is negative and the part where it's non-negative and then it will be important later on. We want to use an integral equation to analyze the limit behavior and integral equations are kind of common in optimal stopping and the standard integral equation that's used a lot in the last decades is this one over here where P is just the transition kernel, the Gaussian transition kernel where we start, go from some point T and X and T and X is usually in the stopping set to some point S, Y in the continuation set and then we integrate over the latter part over the S, Y over here. And it has been shown that under some condition that holds for all points T, X in the stopping set and under some additional conditions you can show that if it holds the other way around for all points at the boundary of S 
then it already characterizes C uniquely. And we want to use that as a starting point to derive another integral equation, a Fretton type integral equation that we can use later on. So we start with the standard e equation and kind of normalize it by putting in um, the transition probability to a special point and the special point we just choose zero, we could take anything else. Um, and as our x, we choose value minus c times t and c is just some vector in Rn. Um, and we do that because we want to look at the limit for t goes to minus infinity. So um, we take limits from t goes to minus infinity and it turns out that this will give us a rather nice representation where we get this um, integration kernel that's just kind of in time inverse harmonic function. So we have c with the standard scalar product with y and then here this part with c squared or norm c squared times the time s and um, here it does not depend on t anymore so we have a Fretton type integral equation here now. So in our special case uh, for discount problems uh, we can write it as a theorem that tells us okay if we integrate over the whole continuation set over this integration kernel and here the interest or discount rate r is written in here as well multiplied by our h tilde then this will be zero and it this holds for all c greater than square root of 2r and it turns out that this is kind of a useful integral equation um, for example it's possible at least in the one-dimensional case uh, to show that these equations uh, define C uniquely and we can use it for some numeric schemes. But what we want to do is to analyze the limit behavior and that is independent of uniqueness because it goes along the lines. So every set C that fulfills these equations has the following properties and so on. Um, so this is our setting. We will look at one-sided problems. So one-sided problems are problems where the continuation set and the stopping set is just divided by a function or by the graph of a function. Um, and we will denote this function either by d and by d as a function from x to, to t or we will denote it by b as a function from t to x and these are inverse. So b is just the inverse of d. And in these kind of settings we can show that usually we have, um, have a limit here where the function turns to and the limit we denote by b infinity and we just uh, assume without a lot of loss of generality that this c0 ends exactly in the point zero. So our function hits this point at zero. And as mentioned before, now this lower left quadrant here is the part where h tilde is lower than zero. Um, and we will split the integral in this part where the integral is negative or non-positive and in this part over here um, where the integrand is non-negative. Um, so here again we have a formal definition of our function d and the function b. Um, and so we split the integral. This is the part where h tilde is negative. This is a part where h tilde is positive or non-negative. And now we can do Fubini and simplify it. So um, we solve the integral for the time part. Then we can simplify and we get this equation over here. And that's nice because on the left hand side this is kind of a Laplace transformation. We know how to handle it. We know everything, every object on the left hand side. So what we are left with on the right hand side is that part d over here, the function d, that's what we are interested in. And the plan now is that we look at c goes to infinity at that limit because we know that the limit c goes to infinity corresponds to time t goes to zero. So um, 
by looking at that limit, we will see uh, what happens to, to d uh, close to the finite time horizon zero. To do so, we have to make some assumptions about the function h tilde. Um, and the method works for different assumptions, but we want to, to stick to the maybe simplest and probably most common uh, idea that h tilde around around zero is just linear. It has to s change sign over here because it's negative in C0 and it's positive or not negative on the other side. Um, and we assume that it can be approximated by just some slope m times x in a neighborhood of zero. Um, the orange dotted one is just, uh, I think it's cubic. Um, we could use it in the same way, uh, but we'll stick, we stick to the mx version. So the left-hand side is easy. We know um, by theory of Laplace transformation that if we multiply it by c squared and then take the limit x goes to infinity, we will just end up with a constant limit m that was a slope. And we can also show that for the right-hand side as well, only a small neighborhood of zero is relevant for the limit. So we know that for the right-hand side, we can approximate h tilde as well by just m times y. Um, so we take the limit, again, multiplied by c squared. Um, and the first thing we can already do is cancel out that m. So we get 1 equals limit. And to simplify that, we'll do a variable substitution. So our new variable z will be c times y. Um, and so 1c already cancels out because of the substitution. And then we see, OK, the second c we can cancel out here. And we are left with uh, this rather nice equation. And what we can do now is just kind of take an educated educated guess what d could be like and then plug it in and see if it works. And if we look here, we have we have a c, 1 over c in the argument of d and we have a c squared over here. And we know since we want to have a constant in the limit that this 1 over c and the c squared have to somehow cancel out. So a sensible guess would be that d is somewhat quadratic. So our guess for now is that b is some constant b times x squared plus terms of higher order in a neighborhood of zero. So we try that, we plug it in. So here we plugged in the value for d. Um, we multiply it out, take the limit, so some parts will just drop out at the limit. Um, and we can see and can show that we are left with a rather nice equation so we have 1 equals that integral. And we can see that the integral is indeed finite um, for any b. Um, so the main problem is solved. And what we can do now is solve this equation for b. And what we get is b is approximately 2.45 something. And what's maybe noteworthy here is that b is a constant. So b does not depend on the discount rate r, and b does not depend on the slope m, and b is a constant for all these problems where h is approximately linear in zero. Um, yeah, so that was the heuristic arguments. Um, we can do it more rigorously and produce some theorem, um, but then we have to kind of see if these limits exist or not. So the theorem says if that limit exists of d, of d of x divided by x squared, and it may exist in minus infinity to infinity, so it doesn't have to be a finite limit, then we already know that the limit has to be minus b with the b we've shown before. And that just means that the limit behavior of d is just b times x squared plus terms of higher order. Um, and we prove it just like we've done before and with some more technicalities. Um, and we can even refine that a little bit more um, by showing if the limit doesn't exist, we are still can show that the limit superior has to be strictly negative. Um, and of course, 
greater or equal to b and that the limit inferior has to be strictly finite and of course lower or equal to minus b. Um, some maybe interesting examples are for example American options with a high dividend. So you probably know that uh, without dividend um, in the limit behavior of American options we get kind of a logarithmic term um, additionally for the, to the quadratic term but if the dividend is high enough and the dividend q is greater than the interest rate r then uh, we are exactly in that setting and we see that we get exactly this limit behavior not dependent on q or r um, and that has been shown before and this is just one uh, example where it nicely reflects uh, the limit behavior we have shown here in more general. Um, okay, so here is another example that we computed uh, using that integral equation before and it's quite simple so payoff function h is just uh, equal to x in here and the interest rate is one but it's only important that it's strictly positive and then we get a slope of d or the function b that one over here um, that looks like that and the dotted orange line we see over here is the limit behavior the quadratic function minus bx squared um, and we see quite nicely that for for small values somewhere around here um, it fits quite nicely Okay, so that's the main part I wanted to tell you. Um, maybe a quick remark on the multidimensional case, because actually the methods we used before work more or less in the same way in higher dimensions. And there it's even more surprising maybe that we get the same constants. So our setting here is um, we assume that C0 is convex now. So we have some shape C0. Um, and to state it in a nice way, we um, introduce a new variable r, r of x, and r is just the distance from x to c0. So we have some point here, and then r is just that distance. Um, and if we again assume that h tilde is approximately linear on the boundary of c0, so it's... Um, not only O of R of X, but it uh, has to be, so the limit has to be somewhat positive. Then uh, again, we get for, for all parts of the C0 around it, we get the same limit behavior, so that D of X is just minus B times the distance squared plus terms of higher order. So you could think about it as we just inflate the C, C0 by constant rate. So not constant rate, but a quadratic rate, but quadratic rate that is the same on on every side. So if we have some some small epsilon and we say have want to look how C minus epsilon is, then it's just inflated by the same same amount on all sides. Um, that theorem is kind of still a conjecture, um, but it looks like at least the methods I've shown you before work in the higher dimensions more or less in the same way. Okay, that's it from me. Uh, thank you and hope to see you in the discussions.